The Lord's church needs strong leaders, but how do we know who's qualified? Is it better to have men who meet most of the qualifications than to have no elders at all? Tonight, join Glenn Colley and Don Blackwell as they sit down with Mike Hickson to discuss this important topic on GBN Live. Live from the Gospel Broadcasting Network located just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Be a part of today's episode by calling in or interacting with us through Facebook. Now from Olive Branch, Mississippi, it's GBN Live. Good evening and welcome again to GBN Live. We're so glad to be with you tonight. We're going to be talking about shepherds. It's going to be a great study. We hope that you will stay with us for the next hour. We have with us tonight Glenn Colley and Don Blackwell. These guys do a great job. We appreciate so much them being a part of the program tonight. Gentlemen, good evening. Good, good evening. evening. Glad to be here. Thank you for being here. Tonight as we begin our program, as we talk about shepherds and we think about the importance of this task, how would you summarize the essentiality of good shepherds in the Lord's church? Well, you know, Titus 1 says that if you don't have shepherds, there's something that's lacking. And the longer you're in the church, you know that the difference between a congregation that operates without elders is still the church to one that does have elders. There's just a world of difference that this is very profound and God knew just what He was doing. It's the way that 1 Corinthians 1.10 can work. And, and that we all speak the same thing, be no divisions among you, sure. be perfectly joined again in the same mind of the same judgment. That has to do with an appreciation for the Scripture, but it also has to do with a ton of, of matters of judgment in a congregation, and the elders are the ones that, that stabilize it. That's right. That's right. They, they are the stabilizing force, aren't they, Don? And of course, Acts 20 says that the elders are responsible for feeding the flock. Sure. Uh, if you don't have elders, imagine not having someone in that role. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17 says that uh, the elders will give an account for your soul. They watch for your soul. And so imagine that you've got someone looking out for your spirituality and helping you to go to heaven and then take that away. And you can appreciate the, the importance of that. You know, Don, I know that you serve as an elder. Glenn, you've served as an elder on a couple of different occasions. When, when you think about serving in this capacity, what are some of the joys associated with being an elder in the Lord's church? Wow, that's, that's a huge question. We could spend the rest of the time on that, Mike. Uh, the, the thing that uh, sometimes people would ask me, is it hard to be an elder? And the answer to that is that some <coughs> days it'll, it'll just chew your legs off. Some days it's really hard, but not most days. And most days it's not. It's, it's, it's very pleasant. And to be connected to people like you are is um, it's a great experience of life. I really honor, what an honor to be an elder in the church. Um, I love preaching. It's what I want to do, but sure. it was a great thing to do for a while. Absolutely. I mentioned Hebrews 13, 17, the elders watch for your souls, and it says, let them do it with joy and not with grief. Uh, there's grief that can come with being an elder, and there's joy that can come with being an elder, kind of like being a gospel preacher. You can do some things that will help change people's lives for the better, and it is such a joy. And the same thing's true with being an elder, when you can help people through a marriage problem or a doctrinal problem and uh, you see people grow and the church stays sound, uh, it's, there's nothing more rewarding than that. Absolutely. You know, I, I remember reading a book uh, by the late Franklin Camp, Principles and Perils of Leadership, great book. And he talked about the joy of service and, and the tremendous privilege and responsibility resting upon those who serve as elders. Do you think in the church maybe we underestimate the responsibility and the weight that elders carry? Well, there's no question that it happens, and that's why those of us who are older have got to be teaching about the eldership everywhere we go. We've got to spend time on this so that the church will be very careful about who they ordain as their elders, that they'll take this, the qualifications very seriously and only ordain men who really have a grasp of uh, the fact that church doesn't belong to them and the weighty uh, load that they've got to carry that, that they so much rests with the Lord. Is, they're fiduciaries, aren't they? They're, the, the church belongs to the Lord and, and they're yes. going to be the protectors of it. And, uh, well, you know, huge. you think about the eldership has the responsibility of, of leading and feeding and protecting the flock. I mean, there are so many responsibilities resting upon these men and yet to do it with joy and to do it with, with the attitude that, look, we're, we're trying to point people in the direction of heaven. Is there any greater role than that. And one of the qualifications that I guess we're going to talk about in a few minutes has to do with whether or not a man has the stuff to do that. I mean, uh, when we talk about uh, examining a man to ordain or thinking about ordaining him as one of our shepherds, you need to be able to look at the things the scriptures say to look at in his life and does he have the stuff 
to help people go to heaven? Can he successfully do yeah. that or not? He may be a great guy in a lot of ways, but does he have that quality about does him? Does he measure up? Not everybody does. That's right. That's and, right. And, and then people who, who are going to go to heaven, but they don't have that quality. Well, you know, I think it takes a special person. And I think based on the qualifications set forth in First Timothy chapter 3, Titus 1, obviously God recognizes it takes a special human being to fulfill this great role. Yes. And Mike, you know the thing about this is I'm afraid that in congregations we oftentimes don't, we don't talk about the qualifications of elders or teach on the qualifications of elders until we realize, oh no, we need elders. And it's kind of a last minute decision, I think. If we hear a sermon on it, we think, oh, we're about to have elders. Uh, and I think because we are not doing it, and I'm not saying everyone, but some congregations are not to teaching on it perpetually, preparing men from the time they're little boys, telling them, uh, you, you should be an elder one day, and instilling that desire. This is something that should be taught on regularly, uh, making them want this. People understand the qualifications because what happens when you wait to the last minute, I think um, maybe we're inclined to want to fudge the, the qualifications a little bit because, hey, if we don't do this, we're not going to have elders. Well, you know, I, th I think, let me just very quickly say that if you would like to join our conversation tonight, we'd love to hear from you. Please call us 888-805-3390. Feel free to email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Again, we'd love to take your questions, comments. Uh, we would certainly invite you to be a part of our program tonight. And as, as uh, maybe we dig deeper into the statement that you made just a moment ago, we prepare to preach, to teach. And I think about all the training that goes into preparing men to preach and teach the gospel, and we need to do that. But do we prepare men enough to, to serve in this role? I want to play off what Don just said, because this is so right. And, and, and it needs to have a practical side to it, which is that why, why don't we have classes in all of our congregations and every person representing a congregation needs to promote this now. And, and our teenage boys need to have a class. Every generation of them should have a class uh, to prepare them to start thinking about elders. Now I know they're just kids, but you got to start. Plant, a Plant seed. those seeds. And then you ought to have a plan. I think, I think the present elders ought to be thinking about the guys in their 20s and 30s and be talking privately with them. Now one day we're going to need you. That's right. And so we want, we, you know, we want you to think like this, be studying the Bible, grow close to God, take care of your family because you need to have your eye on the eldership. And then when we get guys that are in their 40s, the late 40s, and they're getting close, maybe not quite right, but they're going to be, we, we need to create, I believe, an elder grooming program in our right. congregation. You may need to bring in somebody from outside. If you do, that's fine, but we need to have preparation so that we don't do what Don was talking about where you have an emergency and you pick the wrong guys. Don't you think that even maybe citywide that, that we ought to have some type of cluster group where we where we have men come together for that very purpose, for training and teaching and mentoring them to become leaders in the Lord's church. And you know, we talk about leaders, that leaders aren't born, they're made. And, and I think that there are some people who obviously are born with certain innate abilities to lead, but, but to really understand the magnitude of the work at heart. Well, I think at, at that's hand. why good elders are always watching. Glenn mentioned uh, younger guys that have the potential. And maybe they say, this fellow is developing all the characteristics but you know he's not teaching and so they're going to go to him and they're going to say, hey, we've got to get you teaching because they're going to look at what he's lacking and they're building an elder and they're looking years down the line and they're trying to build good solid men and I think every good eldership ought to be doing that. I agree. Well, I agree. what the elders have to do is to start planting the seeds for the future when they're going to be dead and gone. You that's know, right. we're, we're preparing for the church after we've left and, and that's kind of hard to do because you have to look into the future and yeah. do something you're not personally going to benefit from. Yeah. Well, if you, look at, uh, if you look at the church and you think about the perpetuity of the church and uh, there are new generations coming on and so to, to be teaching the younger generation to rise up and to assume that mantle of leadership. You know, Joshua, for example, Joshua had the, uh, the ability, or he had tremendous ability, but he had the opportunity to study under the tutelage of Moses. Yeah. And, and you think about how invaluable that was. And so if we can, if we can mentor our young men to, to rise up and assume this uh, great role, I think it would be a blessing. I talk to, to churches sometimes, or elders sometimes, who will say, we just, we're small, we do not have anybody who's going to be ready in five years or 10 years or probably 20 years that, that's lined up. And the answer to that is why, if you've got teenage boys, whatever you've got, you start training now. Right. And even if it happens again after you're gone, 
you've got to do something because this is the Lord's church. It's very hey, important. I, here's something I think we ought to say as we're starting this. It is God's desire for the church to have elders. And if we choose not to do that, we're not doing right. Um, I know of a congregation uh, that I used to be associated with. They were a congregation of several hundred. They had existed for more than 50 years. They didn't have elders. I mean, they could have grown elders in that amount of time. But um, they said to a friend of mine on one occasion, they said, look, things are going well here right now. We don't want elders to come in and mess things up. Uh, that's not scriptural. That's not God's way. Um, now, certainly a congregation, if they don't have qualified men, could exist scripturally without elders, but we ought to be working toward that goal. That is God's ideal. Well, no doubt, no doubt. Questions come in. If a congregation does not have elders, if a small congregation does not have elders, is that congregation pleasing to God, which is really, uh, I think, kind of piggybacking on what you're talking about just then. I, and I would say the answer to that is it depends on the reason. If a congregation does not have qualified men, then they cannot have elders. If they do have qualified men or they're not working to develop qualified men, then there's a different situation because that is God's ideal. You only operate without elders, men's business, committee, or whatever you're doing. You only do that because you're working toward the other and you haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. And let's go back for just a minute to this whole idea of training and teaching. I had a, a good elder tell me one time that you can train a preacher in a shorter amount of time than you can train an elder. And he's right. Because you think about, you know, you can send a guy to school at the age of 20, 21, 22 years old, 18 years old, and, and within three, four years, he's ready to preach the gospel. But it takes time to, to bring about the qualities set forth in Scripture, maturity, et cetera, for, for a man to serve as an elder. And the fact is that you wouldn't, you wouldn't get men who were in their mid-50s and bring them to a school of, of shepherding because what they've got to have They've got to already have those qualities in place when you choose them and ordain them. That's what right. you do is to have a school for guys in their 20s. So, and that's already being done in some smaller ways. Polishing the Pulpit is doing a great deal of work to, to train and encourage and grow elders. And, but you've got to get them in their 20s. You've got to get them when they're young. That's when you start the prep. And, right? and, they, and don't you think that you've got to plant that seed, as you said earlier, and then help them to, to grow into that role in, in the sense that they aspire to become a leader in God's God's kingdom. Yes, and that's why I said earlier that um, from the time they're little kids, we want to instill that desire. And we could do the opposite. You know, if a parents go home and on the way home from worship they're bashing the elders or bad-mouthing the elders, they may unknowingly be making their children grow up to think, their sons to think, I never want to be an elder because look how they treat him, when we ought to be doing just the opposite. Right. Well, no doubt. Now the questions come in. Why can't we have schools for training those who desire to become an elder, the most important role in the church, which really goes back to what you mentioned just a moment ago with PTP and other venues out there that, that uh, are trying to, to train our young men. schools, by and large, are young men, and they, they have either no family or a young family. I know this is not always true, but typically true. And, and to, to come for two years to a preaching school, is there's a practical aspect to that. But you take a man who's 50, and, and he's at this place in his career, whatever that happens to be, and, and for him to stop for two years, um, there's another reason, that's just another reason why it would be very difficult to make this happen. We just need to start while they're young. I and agree. then as we get closer in our congregations, what we should do, I believe, is, is have these guys who are, they've turned 50 or whatever you choose, but they've turned 50 and you think they're, they're almost ready, let's set up a grooming program for a couple of years and, and really crash course and get them ready to do practice things, uh, do, do case studies and, and challenges. And we, we did this at West Huntsville uh, for, the, for the elders that we have now. And, you know, we turned over, Mike, every doctrinal rock that we could think of, the current elders did, in prepping these, these new guys. We, everything we could think of so that when they became elders, we didn't have any surprises. You didn't have any, any Bible class where a new elder gets up and he says something that's just off the, wall. off the wall. We already had talked about every doctrinal issue that we could think of, and we knew where he was. It's tremendous. And really the answer to the question, why can't we have training classes? Uh, we can and we should. That's the, that's the responsibility of the local church. Yeah. Um, in Titus 1 and 5 where... Um, 
Paul told Titus to ordain elders in every city. The idea wasn't that you're just going to go in and bam, you're an elder, you're an elder, you're an elder, but there's some training and there's some work. There's a procedure involved in this. And every congregation in some way, shape, or form should have a program in place to do this. Yeah, you know, as you guys were talking, I couldn't help but think about a couple of families that are spoken of in Scripture that basically... I, I guess laid the foundation for their children to become great servants of God. The first, Hannah. You, you remember Hannah prayed for a child and she said, as long as this child is, is alive, he'll be granted to the Lord. That was Samuel. And then I think about uh, the mother and grandmother of Timothy. Now, Timothy didn't serve as an elder as far as I know, but he became a great evangelist. But you remember Paul talked about the genuine, the unfeigned faith that dwelt first in his grandmother, then in his mother, and then he said, and I am persuaded in you also. Okay, so when did all that occur? Well, over in chapter 3, verse 15, 2 Timothy, Paul said, and that from a baby, from infancy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. And so they planted the seed and then watched that boy blossom and grow into a great servant of God. In a house where you, where you really appreciate the elders and you talk about and you pray for them in your family Bible time at night. You could do things that make uh, your boys aspire to the eldership and your girls think about what, what a great thing to be married to a man who would be an elder. To, to look up to them and to, to see to them, them as, as tremendous role models. And uh, one of my best friends, uh, two of my best friends, their dad was an elder. And uh, his mom and dad were just exemplary in every way. He was an elder in the Lord's Church, uh, served as an elder for two different congregations for many years, my home congregation, and uh, was just a rock. And uh, though they're deceased, I still have some of the fondest memories in my mind of those two people. And they, they set an example that uh, I'll never forget. And, and, and I, I look up to them to this day, and they have no idea the, the impact they had in my life. And, and so, you know, I think that, that, that leaders can become tremendous examples and uh, influential in our lives. Everybody watching tonight ought to, who's, who's in the church ought to think back about the elder or elders that meant the most in your life and then to, to examine what kind of qualities made them that. The ones who influenced you the most, the ones you admired the most, why was that true? That's true. That's true. And you'll see some of this and, and it's what we need to be training these boys to be. So true, so true. Other questions come in. What's the difference between an elder and a deacon? Good question. Don, how would you respond? Well, the qualifications of uh, elders and deacons are listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3. There are different qualifications. Um, the short answer is elders are leaders in the church. Uh, Acts 20 tells them to, Acts 20, 28 tells them to shepherd the church of God, that they are overseers of the flock. Deacons are not overseers. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17 says that uh, we're to obey them. Uh, elders actually have authority. They're the leaders. We're to obey them. They're the overseers. Deacons are not that. Deacons are special servants to the congregation to work in a special work. Sometimes I hear people say, uh, you know, pray for the leaders of the congregation, elders and deacons, and, and I know what they mean by that, but um, the deacons are not the leaders of the congregation. They work in a special work. Maybe you're the deacon over cleaning the baptistry, but there's two different sets of qualifications. Ones are the spiritual leaders, Working under them would be the deacons that have special tasks that, assigned to, that are assigned to them, typically in the physical realm. Yeah, you know, you, you, you used a term that, I'd, that I'd, I'd really like us to explore for a minute. You talked about the authority of, of elders. What does it mean when we talk about the authority of the eldership in a local congregation? The elders don't have legislative authority. Uh, the New Testament is our authority, and, and the New Testament is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. But there are matters of judgment that are necessary in governing a congregation. And again, it's, it's 1 Corinthians 1.10. How, the, how is it that we can all speak the same thing? And the answer to that is that if you and I are in a congregation and, and we have a disagreement about how something should be handled, and so you and I, we just can't see eye to eye. We go to the elders, and what we do agree on is that we respect their leadership, and we and so we get their their decision, and that's you know we walk out and we're brothers and we agree, because they're the shepherds. Uh, the authority is perhaps most plainly stated in Hebrews thirteen seventeen: Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account. You know within the, the realm of their jurisdiction, if you please. The, the judgment of elders, duly ordained elders of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 20, um, 
w within their realm of jurisdiction, I would say that their their judgments are as weighty as an apostolic injunction. Sure. Well, and, in, in matters of expedience. In matters of expedience. I've, I've oftentimes they work. Excuse I've oftentimes me. heard it said that way. Elders have only have authority authority in the realm of expediency. That is where God has given us a command but we have some um, leeway not specifically to find how to carry it out. So he tells us to meet on the first day of the week. What time? We, we've got to pick a time. So elders have authority to decide that. When they decide the time, it is binding. The, the brethren are expected to be there, and then it is as if God himself put that in place. Sure. sure. Well, we had, we had, at West Huntsville the other day, we had a question. I do questions and answers once a month on a Sunday night, and had a question about social drinking. And, and so we, I developed that from the scriptures and talked about the things that you'd assume. But then I ended it by saying one more thing. Uh, our elders have made it very clear that in our spiritual lives, our walk with the Lord, it is wrong for us to be drinkers. And, and you know what? If that was the only one, only reason you gave that we shouldn't drink, well, that would do it. Yeah. That's a good point. Good point. You know, I've sometimes heard people say things like this. Well, we have given women leadership roles in our congregation, but they haven't uh, usurped that. The elders have given them that position. Elders don't have the right to do that right. because they can't make up laws for God and they can't change laws from God because that is taking them out of the realm of expediency and putting them in the role of God, which becomes sin. Yeah, you know, and, and I have heard the same thing. You know, elders will say, you know, that we have... We have been discussing and researching a particular topic, whether it be instrumental music, women being used in a more expanded role, and then we have come to this conclusion, and so we're going to do this. Well, we do, they, they don't have that authority. Right, right. So uh, to just be mindful of that. We're going to take a quick break. We will be back in just a moment. hope you'll stay with us. Hi, I'm Kevin Rhodes, the host of Expositions on GBN and the director of the Brown Trails School of Preaching in Bedford, Texas. We offer a two-year intensive program at Brown Trail with a curriculum designed not only to teach the entire Bible, but also to prepare men with all the skills needed to work as gospel preachers. Skills ranging from preaching sermons to teaching Bible class, from learning to work in Greek and Hebrew to knowing how to work with elders and congregations, from doing sound exegesis to creating expository sermons, from working in radio and television to writing blogs and more. With a diverse and experienced faculty at Brown Trail School of Preaching, we believe in building knowledge, building skills, building character, building preachers. For more information, you can find us on the web at wementorpreachers.com. Hallelujah, hide the glory, revive us again. Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us live each week. You can send your questions through Facebook in the comments section, and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. Thank you so much for staying with us. We are going to continue our study of shepherds, and we've had a great discussion thus far. We want to get back to a question that has come to us via Facebook. How does a congregation remove ungodly elders? Good question. And I think that is a question that some people have wrestled with in days gone by. How do you remove a guy that does no longer meet the qualifications set forth in Scripture? Well, the first thing you need to know is that the Bible does not spell this out for us, which is kind of remarkable to me. It looks like that, that we would have a chapter or two that Paul would have done that, but he didn't. And, and perhaps it's because there were some, I would assume, teachings that, that should govern us just by good sense. Um, w one of the things I would say, the first thing is, you, but you better be really careful about this because removing an elder has the potential of splitting a congregation. You better be sure that, that when you say ungodly, that that's what you mean. But if it really is ungodliness and not just that he's using poor judgment or that people don't particularly like him, you probably are going to do the same thing you, with him that you would with another ungodly, impenitent member, uh, that, that you would practice some kind of discipline. Uh, so, I, I, so most cases it's not ungodliness. Most cases it's just that, you know, he is, uh, he's not, maybe he's a hothead or, or some issue like that and we're just tired of him. And so, uh, what I would suggest is that 
when men come together in an eldership, it would really be good for them to start on this basis and continue saying this occasionally to one another. Uh, I, I love this church. I would never want to hurt this church. If the other elders, if you guys ever believe that I'm going to hurt this church or I'm hurting it, you won't have to tell me twice. Unless it's a doctrinal matter of standing for what's right. If it's my personality or whatever, yeah. I'll resign. Don't, don't, don't you say think this. I think this is important. If it comes to a man who's a problem in the eldership, the other elders need to take care of this. That's well, right. that's there what I was going to say. Don't you think that the other elders within the sphere of the eldership ought to police themselves, yes. so to speak, yes. Yes. And, yes. and let them handle the situation. work, of course. And, and then the fact of the matter mm -hmm. is you, you're going to do the best you can. I, we, we do not have biblical precedent for this uh, where, where you talk about elders in the church. I mean, you have diatrophies, but you had an apostle coming, you know, who would correct that. I, I do think about the principle. This is not exactly what it's talking about, but the principle in Titus chapter 1, after giving the qualifications of elders in verse 9, he says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. And, and so what he's saying is this, when there are problem people in the congregation, one of the duties of elders is to take care of this. You've got to address this. So if you've got an elder that, like Glenn said, that we're not talking a matter of personality, but we've got an elder who's in sin. Maybe he's teaching false doctrine. The other elders are the ones to take care of this, not a congregational uprising or a vote or something like this. The other elders should go to him and say, uh, brother, you are not right. You, you need to, because we have to think about this too. Each elder is subject to the eldership himself. Just because you are an elder doesn't mean you're not under that eldership. So when the eldership comes to you as an elder, they also are watching for your soul. That's true. That's true. Uh, what, what about in a situation, I know of a congregation years ago that had a couple of elders, uh, and uh, at one time they had had four or five elders, and <clears throat> through a series of events, they were down to two. And the two men, they were good, they were good men in many ways. They were, they were weak to some extent, biblically speaking, and the congregation as a whole wanted them to step aside and replace them with a couple of men that, that were qualified. And, and I never will forget uh, during this congregational meeting, one of the men who was an incumbent elder got up and he said, you know, I can see that the congregation has lost confidence in me as a leader, as an elder. And he said, based on that, I'm willing to step aside. And, and I look back on that and I think about what a Christian gentleman he was. And uh, I, I think that, as you said a moment ago, this can be a very volatile situation if it's not handled correctly. But is it possible that men who are serving as elders could lose the confidence of, of the people that they're overseeing and on that basis possibly need to step aside? <clears throat> it's, it's just so varied. Every congregation has a different personality and, and the way these things come about. I, I, would, I would just add to this discussion that, that the time you fix this usually is in the process of first ordaining a man. Because you think about the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, so he must be temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, not violent, not greedy for money, gentle, not quarrelsome. You know, you have personality things. And, and, and if we, as Don was saying earlier, if we ordain too quickly or we're just in a, an emergency situation and we've got to get somebody and we pick the wrong one, it's going to come back and bite us. And That's exactly very right. often what you're describing is because we didn't do a good job That's at the exactly. beginning. We, did, we didn't vet them we didn't properly. Vet them. I have oftentimes hmm. said it is a lot easier to put a man in the eldership than it is to get him out of the eldership. Oh, wow. And if you rush, and particularly you get an unqualified man in the eldership, he's not of the character maybe not going to be of the character he should be because he doesn't meet qualifications. And then when you have a problem and he needs to step down, he may not be that kind of man. And so you've put a man in, the, in a leadership position that's maybe going to be there for a long time, and it's a problem that's going to haunt you for a long time. Yeah. You know, going back to something you said, Glenn, you, you looked at those qualifications that, that Paul set forth in verse Timothy chapter 3. Is it possible that, that maybe we fail to look at the entirety of those qualifications. In other oh, words, we focus yes. on one or two to the exclusion of the others. Yeah, does he have 
does he have children? And, and do they come to worship faithfully? You know, we, uh, we, we've minimized these in a lot of ways. And this, a lot of this is, is sort of subjective and it's about his personality and it's about looking into the future and seeing, is this a man who's wise or, or not? Now, I wanna say something to interject this at this point. We, we don't want to get to the mindset where no one is qualified that's to be right, an elder. That's, right. that's the other extreme of the spectrum. Uh, we're gonna, the, the Lord knew, Paul knew when he gave us these qualifications that he was talking about real people, men, uh, but we just need to be sober. Absolutely. Well, you know, when Paul says, you know, that, a, that one who serves as an elder is to be blameless, he's not saying sinless, right. but, and, and I think there's a difference there. And, and so I think to understand that, that those who serve in the eldership, they're still human beings. They're fallible. Can we talk about blameless? <coughs> Can we just take a minute? Yeah, to sure, talk about absolutely. Blameless? Just to clear that up, because maybe some viewers who are curious about that. First Timothy chapter 3 says a man must be blameless, but the Greek word for that means cannot be laid hold of. And the point is that there cannot be any impenitent sin in his life right now that defines him. Neither can there be sin in his past that is so egregious that when people think about him, they think about that sin. They're sustained. Right, and, and so, you know, so you get to the end of the qualifications and he must have a good report of them which are without. And that's the same idea, you know, is there some sin that he's been involved, maybe he's repented of it, but he's been so involved in it for so long that identifies him. So blameless means that. He's a man who owns his own mistakes, he corrects them when he knows about them, and people recognize him as an honest and good man. In 1 Peter 5, 3 says that elders are to be examples to the flock. If you have this man who's got, when people think of him, they think of sin, and this is the guy yes. who's the example to the church, then it's just going to propagate that problem. No, no doubt, right. no doubt, That's no right. doubt. And, and I like what you said about a good report from without, because his standing in the community says something to, to people in the community. Yeah. They're not going to say, oh, is, wasn't he the bank teller that embezzled all that money and went to prison for a while? That's not what they're going to say about him. I know him. He, he's one of my neighbors. You know what? He's a good man. That's right. That's right. Another question. Since Scripture teaches that elders and deacons are not to be given to much wine, is it okay for them to have a little wine? No, of course not. Um, you know, Ephesians 5, uh, 18 says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, the phrase there, be not drunk with wine, is from a, a Greek root, methusko. Um, and it carries with it the idea quite literally, uh, it's an inceptive verb, it carries with it the idea quite literally, do not begin the process of getting drunk with wine. So if a person takes the first drink, he has begun the process of getting drunk with wine. And that applies to all Christians, to elders or deacons uh, and all, you know what's interesting, most of the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 apply to all Christian men, not all of them. I mean, you don't have to be married uh, to be a faithful Christian, but most of the characteristics of elders, most of the qualifications are just those of godly men. That's right. Now, I would add, that's right. I would add one thing to that is that pro prohibition of something egregious given to wine would be somebody who drank a lot of it. The fact that he prohibited a large amount does not license a small amount. It would be very much like Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. He's not saying that it's okay for you to get involved in a little sin, yeah. he, because he's prohibiting a lot. And anyway, yeah, absolutely. there you are. Absolutely. Uh, another question that's, uh, that's come in, is it a sin to not respect the elders in respect to attendance at every assembly? <clears throat> Yes, you know, sometimes I've heard people say, uh, you know, show me the verse that says I have to come back on Sunday night, or show me the verse that I have, I've got to be there on Wednesday night. The Lord only says Sunday. But when you look at, you know, we've referenced several times Hebrews 13, 17, that uh, if you match that with Acts 20, 28, that the elders are to shepherd the flock, they're overseers, they're to feed the flock of God. <coughs> so they're looking out for the spiritual well-being. Now exactly how they're to do that is in the realm of expediency. If the eldership decides in our efforts to feed the flock, we need the flock to come together on Wednesday nights for us to meet. We then have obligation to obey them and to do that. And if we buck them in that, we are actually bucking God. We're in rebellion to God when we do that. So yes, it would be a sin to uh, forsake under those circumstances. If they don't have authority in that. You know, they, and furthermore, think about authority, Mike. It, Authority in the church, like in so many different areas of life, doesn't kick in until you don't agree with it, <laughs> right? And you don't agree with it, but you do it because that's authority, right? That's right. And that's so, right. 
surely, surely it's applicable to, if, if not anything else, it would be applicable to this, wouldn't it, come to, come to worship when we set aside the time? And, and you know, you know when, when elders have members who regularly absent themselves from the worship services, how, how should they handle that? Well, obviously some judgment's going to come into play about where they start, but if they think about the fact that we're going to answer for this person's soul, on the day of judgment, I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give an account for that person's soul, and my soul is on the line based on that person, then they're going to be very diligent about this. You know the whole idea of a shepherd and a sheep. The idea is that the shepherd cares for the sheep and he's going to feed the sheep and he looks out for the sheep and he protects the sheep. And so if you've got a member of the church referred to as a sheep and the elders of the shepherd, if he starts becoming unfaithful and you know that he's slipping, what are you going to do? Immediately you're going to go to this person and, and you're going to express concern and make efforts to get him back and maybe have a study with him and have the congregation reach out and what, exactly which methods they employ. I don't know, but he's going to be very proactive about this. Well, I think Luke 15. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. why you need wise men of the eldership because at this point what they're going to be is very discerning. Is this a sin of rebellion or is it a sin of weakness? And how long has this person been a Christian? And, and all of those kinds of questions are going to surface now and decide how they're going to treat this, this man. Well, absolutely. Another question that's coming in, what if a congregation only has a single man who's qualified to be an elder? Is it scriptural to have a single elder? No. Acts 14.23 and Titus 1 both say they ordained elders in every church or elder, every city. Absolutely. But even if we didn't have those passages, I, I think just reason would dictate that, that uh, it'd be a terrible mistake. You know what? I, I've been in assemblies where I was an elder and we only had two elders there. Or I remember one case where I was the only elder there. Other guys were out of town. And I'm telling you, you don't, you don't need to be the only, only elder. With boots How does the on the congregation ground. Congregation deal with, uh, with with a situation where, let's say, you have one man who possibly uh, exercises authority, maybe more so than the others. In other words, a lead elder, so to speak. The more How, assertive how, person yeah, 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 yeah. How, how do you handle that? <clears throat> uh, well, you know, uh, th this is going to happen, and and the Lord. When he constructed, when the Holy Spirit constructed the idea of an eldership, he knew that you were going to have different personalities coming to the table. Everybody brings something to the table, and everybody must have an equal say in how the church is governed. Sure. But you're going to have, I think, always going to have some personalities that are more assertive. And, and when he comes in, he needs to be told that. The fact that you're more assertive doesn't mean that, that you can ever be domineering. In the, because what will happen is you have elders in there that are afraid to speak before they hear him speak. Sure, sure. And that's, so what I would do about that, too, is I would make sure that the other guys were, were more typically the ones who would make public announcements. Yeah, do you, I mean, you know, there, there are some guys who are leaders, others who are followers. <clears throat> and there are some guys who are just yes men. And, and, so, and, and I know that there are good men who recognize that they are more assertive and, and, and they try to step back and not assume that. that I was going to say, <clears throat> the men who meet these qualifications, the Lord has said, these are the men who are qualified to lead my church. Uh, you're going to have men in varying degrees of personalities, you know, some that are stronger than others. But a man who meets these quali uh, qualifications is, should be a man who's got the wisdom to know that about himself. And so he's going to say, I'm of this character. And he's going to keep himself in check that way. And I've he's going to... I'm sorry. Oh, I've, I've heard such men say... Uh, that in an elders meeting that he always tries to wait until the other guys have spoken before he expresses his opinion because he knows right. what you just said. Right. And, and don't you think there's a difference between someone like that and a modern day diatrophies? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, he's just domineering and it's his way or the highway. Well, yes. the alternative would be that we just don't ordain a man who has an assertive personality and that would be a mistake. Yeah. Mike, you know, it made, made me think about this. Sometimes when a person says he desires the work of an elder, people will say, oh, he wants to be in control. You know, he's got the desire to, to run the church or he's got a desire for power. And I think in 1 Timothy 3, when he lists the qualifications of elders, he begins by saying that if a man desires the office of a, of a bishop, he desires a good work. And uh, I've sometimes heard people say that's the first qualification. I don't really think that's a qualification. I describe it as a clarification because after stating that, he goes on to say a bishop then is, and he states the qualifications. But I think the point he's making is this. Brethren, if a man desires the office of a bishop, 
He desires a good work. Don't think something ungodly about him. Don't look at this man and say, oh, he's out for power. That's a good thing. You should appreciate and encourage men who desire to be but elders. Don't, don't you think, you know, when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love thinks no evil, that we ought to, you know, rather than putting a bad spin, think about it in a positive way, which leads me, one of the questions that we have tonight, since the desire for the office is a qualification, will otherwise qualified men be held accountable for not serving when they're needed? What about a guy who is qualified, who seems to meet the qualifications of an elder, but is somewhat reluctant to serve? How, how do you deal with that? You know, when I think about that a man must desire to serve, I think that maybe people got a misconception about this. Number one, when we list it as a qualification, people think in their minds, I don't really want to do that because there are some hardships and, you know, there's a lot of headaches with that. So I don't desire it, therefore I'm not qualified, therefore I won't do it. I don't think at all that is the point of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, I believe that um, when you think about desiring it, may maybe this is a good illustration. When the Lord, the night before he went to the cross, he didn't desire what he was about to do. It was certainly going to be something that was going to be unpleasant. But he wanted to do the will of the Father. And so in that sense, he did it because he wanted what was right. Uh, just because we know there are going to be some hardships and some things that we don't want and don't, we, we don't desire, that doesn't disqualify us. I think that a man enters into the role of an elder knowing, I'm going to have some sleepless night. Glenn's got a book on elders called uh, Awake at Night. Uh, I know I'm going to be awake at night. I know there's going to be some hardships. Not that I desire that. No man desires that. But he wants to serve the Lord and his church. And don't, don't you think the same thing could be said about a preacher? I, I remember when I, wanted, you know, when I said I wanted to preach and began making preparation to go to school. My grandmother was, her, her biggest concern was, could I take the criticism? And, and I, I've been treated extremely well by brethren. And, uh, you know, the, the bad has been very minimal. Uh, the good has far outweighed it. But I understand her, I understood her concern. I understand it more now than I did at the time. But I never viewed it as, you know, I never viewed it as, well, what about the sleepless nights, the, the, the difficulties, et cetera. I, I looked at it as something, this is what I want to do. And, and I looked at it from the positive rather than the negative. And I think about Hebrews chapter 12, when it talks about Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, uh, to, to see the end result of what he did. Well, not only that, too. I mean, that's, that's so true. Uh, but look, the, God put us in this generation for a reason. And those of us who have been members of the church for a long, long time, we, we, have, we, have, uh, we have warmed by the fire that others have kindled. We've served under elders, great elders, and now they're gone. So many of them are gone. And, and isn't it our, our turn to take our place? Uh, they had to, they needed to, and we love the church too, and we should take our place. Yeah, you remember when, you remember, in, I, I, love in, uh, I, I love in the book of Joshua when God said, Moses, my servant, is dead. And if you think about hearing those words, and then he said, and then he told Joshua, arise. There you are. And, and you know, it, you know it's, it's almost as if God said, look, Moses, look, look, Joshua, my servant Moses is gone. It's time for you to step up. Yes. It's time for you to assume the mantle of leadership. And he said, you know, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. And the greatest old elder that you know today was, was once a boy. It's true. And, and, but I want to add one more thing, if you don't mind, and that is that 1 Peter 5 says about elders, not by constraint, but willingly. So the balance to what we're talking about is that if, if you have to pressure a man into the eldership, you're making a mistake. I believe on both ends that we ought to, to respect this office enough that if we have to pressure him, even if we think he's a great guy for this job, but if we have to pressure him into it unduly, we shouldn't do it. He, he'll hurt us. But also on the other end, I've always felt like that a man should be able to resign with respect. Because some, sometimes, you know, he says, I, I'm tired. I've been doing this a number of years. I want to spend time with my wife. Sure. You know, I'm getting old. And, and I think that what we ought to do is, is have a supper for him and love him instead of, uh, instead of pressuring him into staying beyond the time that he's well, ready to you stop. Know, you know, you said something. I want to just, I, I want to ask this question before we get a break very quickly. And that is, in, in the church, do we express our appreciation mm -hmm. to elders as much as we should? I feel, I fear 
that uh, they hear far more criticism than, than compliments. Depends on the congregation, <coughs> of course. If people <coughs> knew what their uh, good elders, if they're good elders, if people knew uh, what they were doing, what they were expending to do this job, it would be easier to be grateful. I, 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 try, I try to tell our elders how much I appreciate them, and, and I do appreciate them, and I appreciate everything that they do, and I want them to know that. And, and, and my prayer is that as a congregation that we will do that, because you know what? It's tough. You know, we, we've referenced Hebrews 13, 17 several times tonight, but the end of it says something that relates to what you just said. Obey them that have the rule over you, submit yourselves, they watch for your souls, that they may do it with joy, not with grief. And then the end says this, for that would be unprofitable for you. Yes. Appreciate these men, love the, these men, make their job easier, and it will be better for you in the, in the long run. And couldn't the pulpit sort of set the pace for this, Mike? I mean, yeah, what absolutely. you were saying is great. From the pulpit, the preacher, it's healthy for the church, for the preacher to love the elders from the pulpit and vice versa, and the church feels secure. But it also sets a kind of a, a pattern. Let, let, listen to what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, be at peace among yourselves. And, and, and you know, to lift them up, and, and to, to, to be supportive of them, to lift them up in prayer, but also to lift them up uh, just by way of encouragement, to let them know we appreciate them, and we appreciate their sacrifices, because no doubt they, they make great sacrifices. We're gonna take a quick break. We will be right back in a minute or two. Hope you'll stay with us. You can watch the latest episodes of GBN Live on YouTube after tonight's show. You can search for Gospel Broadcasting Network or simply go to youtube.com forward slash GBN TV. Press the red subscribe button at the top right of the page and you will be notified when new content is available. Stay tuned after the show for some more excellent gospel content. Fills my heart with joy and love. Thank you for staying with us. We're gonna be concluding our program in just a moment or two. We got another question that's come in. Matter of fact, we've got several questions. If an elder is involved in sin, is it the preacher's responsibility to rebuke the elder publicly? Good question. I'm gonna start this answer and then Brother Blackwell's going to finish it. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the answer is that the, the evangelist has a different role in the church that, that, isn't, that an elder does. It's a different office and and uh, in Titus chapter 1, it appears to me that the precedent set is in a church that does not have elders, the evangelist is the one who should ordain the elders. And that makes logical sense because theoretically he's going to know more about the scripture than anybody else in that church and so that would make sense. But a separate office would mean also that there could come a time when the eldership goes wicked. And, um, but my first response to this is extreme caution should be exercised because they have authority. And, and should be reconciled, uh, recognized that way. Extreme caution, because what you're about to do is going to have long-lasting effect and probably split the church oh, and no all doubt. sorts of awful things. It would be only something he would do if there was no other choice. Uh, I think agreed. And I thought about 1 Timothy 2.19 that says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from the mouth of two or three witnesses. Of course, the principle in the Old Testament was you're not going to receive an accusation from just one person. And so if there's an accusation against an elder, uh, there needs to be evidence for this. It needs to be substantiated is, is uh, what he's telling us there. I, I think uh, the word caution uh, ought, ought to be emphasized greatly because, uh, I mean, I mean 
They're talking about a very serious, serious matter. I would, I'd want to have to get a lot of, a preacher, get a lot of outside counsel who, uh, from, from older men who knew that church and knew what was going on. And you just, you're about to do something that's a nuclear bomb. Oh, no doubt. No and doubt. And so, um, caution. Uh, yeah. I mean, you talk about napalming. Yes. <laughs> yes. For sure. Uh, another question. Can a man be an elder if he only has one child? Yes, he can be an elder. Uh, the qualifications, uh, when you read the qualifications of an elder, um, he must uh, rule his household well. He must have believing children. Uh, people get hung up sometimes on the uh, specific definition of the word children, and they say children means uh, more than one. I know good brethren who believe that. Uh, I don't think that the Bible uh, requires that he has at least two because the word children is used in the Bible to refer to people that have one child or more than we use it that way all the time oh, if, sure. if we said anyone that has children raise your hand people that had one child would would raise their hand but I think more importantly does the Bible use it that way um, and certainly it does um, in Matthew 22 24 you've got an example of the Leverett law of marriage Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed to his brother. And of course, if he had one child, he did meet the qualification of having children. Uh, Matthew 19 and verse 29, Jesus says, every one of you has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake. And he talks about the reward they would receive. Well, he's not saying if you only forsook one child, then you're not going to get the reward. The, or, or, or only multiple children. The point is it's used generically to refer to a child or children. And so, yes, if a man has uh, one child, he meets that qualification. Now, can I, I, I believe everything Don just said, and I would add to that that a man who has two children is probably better qualified than one who has one. Having said that, you, where does that end? You know, I, because children yeah. are different, aren't they? And yeah, members of the church over whom this, this elder is going to shepherd are going to be different, and well, he needs that. Certain. That'll help him. But the question is, would it prohibit him from serving if he has one? And the answer is no. I agree. Absolutely. One of the questions that I wanted to throw out very quickly, I know sometimes individuals within a congregation will disagree with maybe something the elders have said or done, maybe a decision that's been made. And so as a result of that, they'll withhold their contribution. How do you... How do you reconcile that with Scripture? I just believe it's wickedness to do so. Because what you're trying to do is to manipulate uh, the eldership with money. It'd be very much like a, a man of wealth who contributes a lot coming to the elders and saying, I don't like the fact that you're doing this mission work. I think we ought to build an extra wing on the building instead. And I'm not going to give you this, this money each week unless you do what I say. And he's circumventing. He's, it's, it's wrong. It's just evil. And, and I think that's what this is. So the question you should need to ask yourself is, are the elders acting within their scriptural jurisdiction to make this decision? And if the answer to that is yes, then even if you disagree with it, uh, you, you know you need to comply. And Glenn, aren't we giving to God? The, the, we're not yes, giving yes, to the yes. we're giving to God. Manipulation of the elders is, is just wickedness. It's just wrong. And again, if the elders are doing something sinful with the money, that's a totally different matter. Yes. Yes. But if elders are doing something that is in the realm of expediency, that's where they have authority. Glenn said something earlier, and that is, uh, you're not really submitting until you disagree. At the point that you disagree with their judgment, that's the point when Hebrews 13 comes in, and Hebrews 13, 17 comes in that you submit to them. Why? I disagree. That's why I'm submitting. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, another question. Is it scriptural for a number of Christians to leave a congregation and worship, worship elsewhere when their eldership is in agreement with a false doctrine? Well, yes. I mean, you, you think about what comes to my mind, Don, is Revelation 2 and 3, 1, 2, and 3, and there's a point at which the Lord Jesus is going to remove the candlestick. That is, I will no longer recognize this congregation as a group of my people. And I don't know, I don't know exactly at what point that happens. You read the seven churches of Asia, and you, you know, it's, it's yeah. up to the Lord. But if I'm convinced that the Lord has removed the candlestick, then uh, I, I need to go ahead and find another place that's faithful. And, and you know, I think Don may have mentioned a moment ago, there's a difference between weak and liberal. Yes, yes. And, and you know, if a, if a congregation were to bring in a, an instrument. It's time to leave. Uh, yeah, you know, there are certain things that I, I think, you know, you cross that threshold and it's... What we're about to face, just to put another point on it, is, is Romans 132. What we're about to face in our congregations is, is an eldership or elderships that are going to endorse homosexuality, mm -hmm. homosexual marriage. 
Uh, we're going to face that, and this, this decision will come to surface when that happens. And, and you know what? That's amazing. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Really we're is. going to have to have elders that really know how to stand on their hind legs and, and be as keen as mustard. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Another question that we have through Facebook, if an elder's wife dies, can he serve as an elder? What if he subsequently remarries? Uh, I do not believe that he can continue to serve as an elder. Uh, if you look at the qualifications of the elders listed in 1 Timothy 3, it says he must be the husband of one wife. Um, we learn several things from that passage. We learn that he must be married. We learn that he must be a man. He can only have one wife. But this is what is significant. Uh, this phrase, must be the husband of one wife. In the Greek, it is in the present tense. And so what it is indicating is that this is a qualification that he is currently meeting. It doesn't say that he once was the husband of one wife. If you look at passages like Romans chapter 7, if uh, a man's wife dies, she is no longer bound to the law of her husband. Uh, that marriage is separated. They are not husband and wife anymore. Matthew 22 settles that question. The Lord says in the resurrection, we're neither married nor giving in marriage. And so if a man's wife dies, he's not currently the husband of one wife. She's not his wife anymore. He's a single man. He doesn't presently meet that qualification. So uh, I don't see how he could scripturally serve. Now, later he remarries and uh, he is examined again to see if he meets the qualifications, and he very well could be reinstalled at that point okay. because he would be the husband of one wife. And you'd want if that happens, what you'd want to do is to to sh to let him be married to the second wife for some period of time because even though he might have all those qualifications, she might be of such nature that she prohibits him really from serving, and so the second uh -huh. wife would have to be proven too in a way, yeah. wouldn't yeah. she? Yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. Uh, another question that we have that has come to us through Facebook, do elders' wives have any responsibilities? Mostly just to wait a lot, <laughs> to, to wait and for them to come out of meetings. <laughs> a lot I'm, of waiting. I'm only teasing. Well, you know what? Surely there are, oh my, he's got to be married. He's got to be the husband of one wife, and that implies uh, the, the responsibility of well, you know, wives. When you talk about you know, he needs to be hospitable, and, and I think about that being he used to be a people person, and she needs to be a people person as well. Yes. You know, I would say this, do, 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 does his wife have responsibilities? There are certain qualifications she has to meet, so there's a certain character she must maintain, and that's a responsibility. But I would say this, this is very important. I've sometimes heard women in the church make a statement like this, well, I made that decision, and I'm an elder's wife. Mm. as if that's a position of authority. There's no such thing as that in the Bible. There's no such thing as a, a lady elder or a she elder or that uh, they have the overseer, um, uh, sheer, uh, the leadership of the church because they're married to an elder. That, that's a made-up position. Good right. point. Got a minute left. Uh, what, what would be just a nugget of truth as regard, I guess, with regard to what we've talked about tonight, particularly as it relates to the local congregation serving as an elder? Um, you must remember that, that the church does not belong to you and, and let that sober you. Great point. And I think you must remember, we've alluded to it, but you're going to answer for these people's souls and there's nothing in the world more serious than that. I'm going to stand before God on the day of judgment and I'm going to say I'm willing for my eternity to be based upon how I handled this person and uh, that'll keep you awake at night. Yes, it will. God yes, it bless will. the men who do it. Yes. Uh, Don and Glenn, thank you so much for being a part of the program tonight. You guys uh, brought a lot of information, a lot of good stuff. Appreciate you very much. Thank Thanks. you for inviting us. Thank you for being a part of our program. Hope that you will tune in again next week. Appreciate you very much. We love, love and thank you for watching our program. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching.